And welcome to our last programme of 1973. And you probably recognise some of those pictures. They're all the things that we've done over the past year, and there are quite a few of them we won't forget in a hurry. Yeah, it's hard to pick out any special favourites, but when we were thinking about how we'd spent 1973 on Blue Peter, we looked at all the photographs of the four of us taking part in all the different things we've done. And we've put them all in this giant scrapbook, and they bring back some very happy memories. Well, our book starts with some pictures of a day that Val and I will never forget. It was when we helped take the Christmas puddings and parcels to the men who man the Eddiston Lighthouse, ten miles out to sea off the Devon coast. Halfway across, we lost sight of the turkey. It seemed to have disappeared in the spray and the breakers. But then it turned up again. We could just see the keeper waiting to grasp the parcel as it swung past the door. Maya got off to a freezing start too, diving into the serpentine. It was even colder than I'd expected. You obviously have to be very hardy to be a member of the Serpentine Swimming Club and do this every week throughout the winter. Since I couldn't swim with John, I thought the least I could do was to brew some coffee for everyone when they came out. So I set off to work with a portable stove. The cries of pain coming from the lake made me feel that hot coffee would be called for very quickly. I must admit I wasn't sorry that the rules meant that I could only sit and watch. Someone had told me that once you got used to the water, it wasn't so bad, but it didn't seem to be getting warmer. As soon as the kettle started to boil, I dashed off to help John out. The race didn't seem to have a finish. We'd only been in the water about three minutes, and that was enough for everyone. <laughs> Help me, Mel. <laughs> it's slippery. I think I'm on ice. <laughs> oh, the water's fine. You should come on in. In February, we met Barry Lapworth. In fact, Barry's got to climb up the ladders to get on this monster. And when you sat on there, you must be, what, eight feet tall? Yes. Right, are the, the pedals in the right place? Is that okay? Right? Okay, Barry? You're on your own. Now, what's the difference between riding a small unicycle and a big one? Is there a great deal of difference? Now, when you're on the toy one, you have to think you're riding the small unicycle. So, in fact, you are now thinking you're on the small unicycle and you're not really eight feet up in the air? No. What sort of tricks can you do on that one? A one foot balance. Can you do it now? Yeah. A fantastic bit of balance, is that? Have you ever fallen off? Sometimes when I was learning. And this was when I had a fall. I was learning how to be an apprentice jockey and riding a full-blooded racehorse. By now I'd forgotten all about my toes. I was concentrating totally on hanging on and trying to keep up with the rest of the field. But as a rider, I'm not in the same class as Malcolm and the other apprentices, and they soon began to pull away. Eltor's power was tremendous. I'd never ridden so fast before. It took me all my strength to stay in the saddle. Oh, that looked great, particularly mm. the stalls and the high-speed gallop. Fancy well, that. it was a bit frightening, actually. In fact, I, I'm very delighted that I managed to stay on at all. But uh, my luck didn't last, because shortly after that, Eltor bolted, and I don't think I've ever been so frightened in my life. I had the worst fall I've ever had. Well, I can hardly bear to look, but if you'd like to see what happened, we'll show it to you now, and I'll tell you about it. Now, it should be coming up in a minute. There I am, there I am. Galloping like a lunatic. And there comes Mr. Poston on the white horse trying to stop me, but it didn't do any good at all because Eltor was heading for home. And any minute now, I'm going to come off. Any second now, I don't know how I hang on. There oh. I go! Ooh, oh, crunch!
This was London Airport last March, when fans turned out in their thousands to provide an ear-splitting welcome for their favourite star, David Cassidy. And a few days later, David joined us in the Blue Peter studio for the judging of our Blue Peter Keep Britain Tidy poster competition. David, I wanted to ask you while you were here, why is it that you're cutting short your visit to Britain? Fatigue. No, no, actually, I, um, I have to go back early because we've, um, we've rescheduled our shooting for the Partridge family. Mm -hmm. uh, we've put it back a, a week, so um, I have to go back a week early. Have you enjoyed it over here, though? Oh, it's been great. It's been really great. We had, uh, you know, a lot of work, but um, the concerts were good and uh, the fans were fantastic. Yeah. Really. Well, I know the fans certainly enjoyed waiting to try and see you because the television centre was under siege a couple of days ago. There were lots of girls waiting outside and you weren't there. <laughs> I say, what, what we promised to do, though, David, is to pass on to you a whole load of autograph books, presents, letters and cards that have been Super. sent specially into our office, and I've got them over here for you. Okay. Uh, there's one present there, actually, that is for your dog, Bullseye. It's a rug. Give that oh. to you off oh, the top. Oh, so unwrap it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look at that. It's oh, even got Bullseye. Great. Yeah, it's got a picture it's on it. It's lovely, really lovely. May saw us taking part in one of the most crazy things we've ever done. We volunteered to test the games out for It's a Knockout. Although we'd spent all day building the games, we still hadn't learned all the rules, so Stuart Ferber, who thinks them up, told us exactly what to do. Well, you see the slope? Yes. The balls? Yes. Simply run up the slope and get the balls and put them down on the ground. Yeah. One at a time, is it? One at a time. Oh. When the first one's gone, the second one goes, etc. Right then. Can right? you take more than one ball at once if you can manage it? If you can manage it, try it. <laughs> I see well, you've you soaked it uh, <laughs> totally now. As we changed into our knockout gear, the cameramen moved in to get all the slippery action in full close detail. Right. Here we go. Right, Johnny! Ah! 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 <laughs> Come on, Bobby! Well done! Well done! The drive it. It's wet. Oh! 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 For me, Up Hellier was an unforgettable experience. Now the climax of the ceremony was near, as all the torchbearers circled round and round the galley. This was the moment everyone in Lowick had been waiting for, for a whole year. torches being hurled through the air was a staggering sight. It was a dangerous moment too, but no one went wild and all the torches landed smack in the target area. Fire has been part of the festival for around 400 years, but it's only in the last hundred that a boat has been burned on that hellier night. No one is sure why. It could be because this is what a Viking funeral was like, and after up hellier, winter is dead and everyone is looking forward to the spring. With the galley fast disappearing under sheets of flame, all the squad stood round the fire to sing the Norseman's Home, which marked the end of Uphelia 1973. We've travelled thousands of miles in 1973, but it was Val who clocked up the most mileage abroad with her Blue Peter special assignments. Yes, she reported from Rome, Paris, Vienna, Amsterdam, as well as many important cities in the British Isles. And our next pages in our 1973 scrapbook cover the places she's visited. And I think that without doubt, one of her most memorable moments came when she went to Rome and visited the Vatican City. She met the Pope, one of the most important men in the world. And His Holiness, Pope Paul VI, agreed to meet not only Val, but the whole of the Blue Peter film unit. And in the vast audience chamber filled with 7,000 pilgrims, the Pope sent a special message to the children of Britain.
we are very happy to have this occasion offered us by the British Broadcasting Corporation to send our greetings to the children of Great Britain. Dear children, we wish you to know that you are close to us. We wish you to know of our deep affection for you in the Lord. We pray that God will keep you always in his loving care and prepare you for your life's work. We greet also your families and all your loved ones and give you all our special blessing. Thank you very much. After the speech, he gave us all a present of gilt key rings bearing the papal coat of arms. Thank you very much. Came again? Yes, we would love to. There's more to John Noakes than meets the eye. I found that out when I discovered that this was his hobby, making glass trees in fantastic and very beautiful shapes. With this kind of glass, you can cool it down very quickly. Any other piece could crack into thousands of pieces if you blew like that. Nothing's ever wasted. Even the piece of glass I'd been using as a handle, I turned into a twig. I like my trees to have a frosty look, so I sandblast them in a special cabinet. Inside, thousands of grains of sand are blasted at great pressure at the glass so the door has to be properly shut to keep the sand out of the classroom. You need special gloves too, so that you can handle your work without having your skin peeled off. It didn't take long for the clear glass to go frosty. My tree was beginning to look the way I wanted it. Even at this stage, there could be a disaster. Blasting the thin twigs has to be done with great care or else they break off. But when I do get it right and it's finished, I must admit, I feel quite proud to think I've designed and made a tree out of glass. Well, we've had some very strange record breakers on Blue Peter, but I reckon this one takes a biscuit. Uh, it's about the longest paper chain I've ever seen in my life. They claim it is four miles in length. And uh, they also claim it's a world record. There's no other paper chain quite as long as this. I've worked out that there are about 10 lengths to every metre of this chain. And it's about five kilometres long, the whole thing. That's somewhere around about 50,000 lengths. And they all had to be individually made. Leslie, what are you, how's it going in the middle there? Well, I'm getting a bit confused. Oh, no! I'm sure you are too. Ah, oh, that's better, that's better. Well, you've been wondering what on earth the members of the Ritter Community Association actually did with this chain. The answer is they wrapped it round the whole of their village. It's one of the most extraordinary things I've ever heard of. Now, this was a scene at 3 o'clock last Saturday when Tony Sparks fired the mortar that was the signal for the giant paper chain makers to link up and encircle the whole of Rittle Village.
Here's our liveliest visitor of the year, a six-month-old kangaroo. I've got oh, fish and chips and a cup of tea. Hey, oh, now he's decided to go. Come Can you back. grab macro for his oh. meal? Oh. Eat. This is what's called oh. getting left oh. holding on to the oh. cup of tea. Oh. Run it, come Johnny. Back. Run it. You eat the Run fish it. and chips. <laughs> right. Come on, macro. Come Not going to be much time. Well, <laughs> hey, you can certainly move pretty fast already, can't you? Fear not, fear not. But no, not fear as fast no as John Noakes. Marvellous. The kangaroo on, catcher macro. from down under. Well, for all of us on the programme, one of our biggest events uh, came last summer, when that old bakery in Deptford was finally transformed into our first Blue Peter Old People's Centre. We had a grand opening, complete with brass band and a slap-up tea. And it was such a glorious summer's day that all the old folks were able to sit outside in the garden. And because it was a party, we gave each of our guests a buttonhole as they arrived. <laughs> At last, it was time for the opening, a very proud moment for us. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and good afternoon. On behalf of Blue Peter viewers, it is with great pleasure that Leslie, Pete, and myself are here today to open our first Blue Peter Old People's Centre. It's a miracle to me that a derelict bakery has been transformed into this magnificent uh, centre, and it's all thanks to every single Blue Peter viewer who joined in on the treasure hunt. Uh, we've got eight hot dinner vans in action at the moment. They've been in action for quite a while, but this is the first of two old people's centres to be opened. And we, we hope that everybody here, and at the other one when it's opened, will get a great amount of pleasure from it, as it gives us a great amount of pleasure to declare our first Blue Peter Old People's Centre open. Last summer was an important time for Shep, too. He went to join his sister Sheppy for some advanced training with Audrey Wickham. And for the very first time in his life, Shep was faced with a flock of sheep to control. Because Shep was running so fast near the sheep, he tended to scatter them. So it wasn't surprising when some of them broke away. Shep didn't notice this one go. He was still too close to control the flock. An experienced dog would work the sheep from over ten feet away. But he kept the others together, bringing them up to Audrey. Boy. Steady. Shep, down! Shep, lie down! Lie down! Shep had to obey, but I could see Sheppy wasn't impressed. He's not doing as good as you, is he? Shep, come by! Then he was off again, but he came up so fast that instead of steadying the sheep in front of Audrey, he split them in two around her. But here he showed his breeding by running round behind them again. If he hadn't, they might have got right away. Good boy. <laughs> By now, Sheppy was pretty excited and wanted to help out. But Shep was doing very well for a novice, and I was amazed, considering it was the first time he'd worked with sheep. He brought them back to Audrey, trying to round them up again, until Audrey thought they all needed a rest. For our 1973 summer expedition, we explored the Ivory Coast. Our first adventure was in a dugout canoe when we joined some fishermen from the village of Asuerti. And these breakers were very nearly our downfall. They practically washed us away before we started. Simon gave the signal and everyone pushed like mad. It was shattering. Within seconds, we were faced with an awful sight. A solid wall of water bearing down on us. The boat was awash, but as Johnny and I hadn't been given any paddles, there was nothing we could do to help. 
from the shore, we could tell the canoe was sinking, and I began to wonder if I'd ever see John and Pete again. All of a sudden, we realised the crew had begun to abandon ship. By now, the canoe seemed more like a submarine than a boat. So although we'd been told to hang on whatever happened, Pete and I decided our best chance of survival was to follow our leaders. At that moment, I thought they'd drowned. So it was marvellous when, in between the breakers, I could see heads bobbing up and down and everyone clinging to the upturned boat. Kaku was very reassuring. Yes. It's a little bit dangerous to come back, but not as bad as going down. It just wasn't our day. In a matter of moments, we realised that the breakers were coming in faster than we were. This time we were luckier. We'd been flung out into shallow water, but it took all our strength to keep our feet and drag the heavy dugout back to shore. It's a dog. Yeah, I know it's a dog, yes. Here, who's the guy? That was John Noakes. Huh? John Noakes. Noakes? Yes. Noakes? Yes. <laughs> hey, doggy! <laughs> <laughs> what is yeah. it? What do you want? Are you going to give me any of that later on, a bone? You want a bone later on? Yeah, no, no, not now. No. Just wait a minute. After the show. All right? OK? OK. All right, that's fine. <laughs> Back. <I'll take> it. <laughs> the dog, yeah, I know. He licked me, I know that. But buttons are wet. Don't worry about it. They'll dry out. Oh, you are ridiculous. Should have had my cousin here, you know. Your cousin? Yeah. Why, what does he do? He's a sock. A sock? Hey, that's a point. Yes, of course, you can make a puppet out of a sock, too. But he didn't bring your cousin. Couldn't come. Why not? Tired. Oh, he's tired. Been on his feet all day. <laughs> Scottish wildcats like oh, these are a very rare sight. They'd been reared by Graham Dangerfield, and they lived in a pen at the bottom of his garden. It's never been recorded. Probably the biggest litter in the world. Yes, which is very nice. Oh, that's marvellous. And to our surprise, she's reared the lot. We didn't think she would. We thought she'd lose a couple. But can that, you, that was long can ago. you pick any of them up? Well, if I distract her with my foot, she has to have something to look at, or she might pounce on my hand. She She'd be quite capable of hurting you, would she, if she did Well, she'd just bite him. <laughs> oh, oh, he's fierce as well. Look at this. See, even at this age. Really tough, aren't you? Eh? She. In fact, they're spitting almost before their eyes open. Yeah, yeah. They, you say that they are wild. I mean, obviously it's wild, but are there a lot of them in the wild? Before the war, they were getting very, very rare indeed. There was even a chance they'd disappear completely. And the gamekeepers were then called up to fight, yeah. and the wildcat was saved. And since then, the Forestry Commission have come along and put fir trees all over Scotland, yeah. and they encouraged the wildcat to control mm. small rodents which would damage the young trees. So, for the first time ever, the Scottish wildcat is going forward and very nicely. Yeah, yeah. That looks really healthy and strong, this one. Yeah! <laughs> Don't do that to me, frightening the life out. I just noticed something rather <laughs> nasty. There's a rather large wildcat down there. Is that. That's the male. <laughs> That's father. He's all right, actually. He's OK. He's quite it? nice. Isn't it unusual, though, to keep the male in the same enclosure as... Stop it. In the, in the same enclosure as the mother and the, and the litter? Well, everybody who knows anything at all about wildcats, captive or wild, said, if you don't take the male out, he'll kill the litter. And we telephoned a German scientist in Germany who's made a study of these things, and he said, for goodness sake, leave it in. And they bred last year, but they only had two, and we left him in then, and he behaved beautifully. He loved his kittens, and they love him. And we've left him in, of course, again this year, and he's still dressed the same. Oh, you're proving the German scientist's point. Yeah. Behave yourself. I like <laughs> pussycats. Go back in your box. <laughs> Uri Geller was the sensation of the year. He came to the studio, and Blue Peter viewers' forks and spoons began to bend in their hundreds after seeing this remarkable demonstration. Just have his focus all the time. It's bending, it's in... You can see that crack. Oh. Wait, hold Just it a move little. your finger a sec. You can yeah. see the crack there. Look. Yeah, it's cracking. Yes. Now, it's can the gap. camera focus on this? I don't want to knock the top off. I no. want to let it fall on its own, but it's going to fall. It's, and it's, uh, the fork is still bending more. Let me rub it, give him more. Pump. It's because, now, touch, there is no heat. That's another phenomenon. Touch the crack. That's absolutely true. That it's, is stone no... cold or metal cold. What I'm oh, keeping this saying... This is an amazing yeah, you have to never, really, <laughs> If no, it wasn't no. happening in front of me, I wouldn't believe it. There, it's moving. Now the whole thing is moving. Now it's, yeah, it's becoming plastic now. Yeah. This is what happened on 
You see what's happening? It's yeah. It's like Just it's like in and touch it. There is no heat, absolutely yeah, I, no I, heat. I felt it before. And the fork lets I'll, I can focus in. Uh, well, there. Oh. Uh, there it is. It's on the deck. Where is it? <laughs> I don't know what to say. I, there is nothing to say. This was my most exciting moment of 1973, and this light signaled it. I was free falling five miles with the RAF's Flying Falcons. And we're out in space! It's unbelievable! 25,000 feet! Oh, what a thrilling moment to end our review of 1973 on. Yes, it was, and we hope that your special favourites were included in the highlights we picked out. And now we're looking forward to 1974, and I wonder what will happen then. Well, one thing that is going to happen very early on, actually, next Thursday, is finding out whether or not we've reached the target for our Blue Peter Stampede. Yes, this is the total we've reached on our totaliser. 1,750,000 envelopes meaning we've just got 250,000 envelopes to go before we reach the 2 million mark. Well, there's still quite a bit of counting to be done at the depot, so we may be going to be lucky. So it's cross fingers till Thursday, and then we hope we can announce some very important news. Yes, we'll be back on Thursday at our usual time of 10 minutes to 5. So we'll see you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Next on BBC4, the hits and happenings during our celebrated year are intertwined in the rock and roll years 1973.